Hi everyone, I'm here today to talk to you about all of the books that I read in November. <laughs> that was what was last month? November. Um, and I think there are 19 books for me to talk to you about today. Some of them are long, some of them are very, very short. I will list them all in the description box down below if you would like to go and find out more. So where shall we begin? Let us begin with this one, which is a new release that came out in November. This is When the Lights Go Out by Karis Bray. This is one of these titles that's been pushed back constantly because of COVID. And I really felt for Karis in that respect because, well, for anyone who has a book coming out this year who had their book pushed back and then it still came out during a lockdown, which is um, very, very stressful. So this was supposed to come out in May, I think, and then it got pushed to June and then it got pushed to November. This is her third novel, her fourth book, because she also has a short story collection out as well. And this is as pretty much all of her books are centered on one family, the way that they interact with each other and the intricacies of their relationship. And she is so good at doing that. This is about Chris, who is extremely panicked about the end of the world. There's a lot of climate anxiety in this and he is prepping for climate crisis. And his wife, Emma, who's also extremely worried about those things, she goes on fracking marches, etc. But she's also contending with the emotional load and physical responsibilities of running and looking after a family. So she is frustrated that Chris is giving up so much of his job in order to go and protest in the centre of town on his own, um, shouting into the void in the street about the climate crisis, which she sees as valuable. But then he gets to come home and she's made him a hot dinner and she's looked after their kids and she's taken them to swimming practice. And he sees all of that as a massive distraction. So it's a discussion about climate anxiety, but also about um, the power dynamics and privileges surrounding that. Um, so it's not saying that Chris shouldn't be doing those things, but it's just he's losing sight of the things at home and the now, whereas Emma um, and a lot of other people that Chris encounters are using, as he sees, distractions from the larger problems. Both of these things are true. So it's just examining that really closely. My favourite parts of this book were definitely the miscommunication between family members, that gap in understanding. I love spending time with the characters. I did think other aspects of this novel were quite messy, but I think maybe deliberately so. You're dealing with something as huge as the climate crisis. There's no way of wrapping that up in a novel. So yes, it's given me lots to think about. Next, I read The Confessions of Franny Langdon by Sarah Collins. This is a debut novel. I'm not going to speak about it here because it's the book that I reviewed for Toast last month. So if you would like to know my thoughts, I will link my review in the description box down below. This is really heavy on intertextuality. So it was really fun to do a deep dive. And if you have read this book, I would love to know your thoughts on it over in the comment section of the Toast article. So head on over to that link after you've watched this video and let me know what you thought. I then finished reading this, which is A Lover's Discourse by Jalou Gu. I spoke about this a little bit in a reading vlog that I did where I was reading unsolicited review copies that had been sent to me, and this was one of them, and deciding whether or not I wanted to keep them. And this one intrigued me, so I decided to keep it, um, but unfortunately it was not a book that I enjoyed. This is one of those instances where I can see what a book is doing and I appreciate it, but I still don't love it. So this is narrated from the point of view of a Chinese woman who's moved to London, thinking she is gonna come to this really free, place and it's going to be very exciting but pretty much as soon as she arrives she sees one of the brexit buses that says vote leave and take back control etc and she questions her move she's moved to study she's doing art history and one of the modules that she's doing in the paper that she's going to write means that she goes back to china where she wants to make a a short documentary about artists over there who do cheap reproductions of really famous paintings. And that is what this book is all about. It's about what is real and what is a reproduction and what are the lies that we tell to ourselves. This is also named after Roland Barthes' book, A Lover's Discourse, and that is a series of fragments. So in a sense, this text is following in the footsteps of that. Is it truly original? What new things is it saying? She also meets someone who's moved over from Germany and they strike up a relationship 
and end up living on a houseboat together and he is someone who creates landscapes so he creates lakes his company digs out lakes he does architecture within the landscape and she finds that a bit ridiculous because he says he's creating art but she says but you're destroying art in order to create fictional nature I don't really get it so all of the discussions in this book as I said is about what is real what is not is this love real do we actually love each other or do we just love the idea of each other this book jumps around a lot so it can cover a couple of months in one page and the characters travel from London to Scotland um, to Germany Italy China, Australia and New Zealand and this is only a 200 page book. There are also lots of really convenient things in it to try and make a point. For instance when she arrives in London and she sees the Brexit bus. Similarly it felt a little heavy-handed when she's talking about travel and she has to go up to Scotland and she says and all of the train companies are owned by lots of different companies who make lots of money which mean that our tickets were really expensive and that's exploitation and yeah, I know, it, it is. I'm sure it could have been phrased in a way that didn't feel as though she was kind of trying to ram certain points into the book and squash them in there when they didn't particularly fit. Because it had those moments of let me make a point and because it's darting around so much, even though I can see she's doing it in a fragmented way to reflect Bart's and the topics up for discussion within this book, it didn't really make for a great reading experience for me and I didn't particularly enjoy it. A book I did love though, and I'm so glad I loved it because it was one of my most anticipated releases, is Ruman Alam's book Leave the World Behind. I have not read any of his books before. This is a book about a husband and wife called Amanda and Clay. They're leaving their very busy New York work lives and they're going away for a week in the countryside. I think in my haul I said they left that their two teenage children behind but that's incorrect they bring their teenage son and daughter with them and they go into the countryside they go to a supermarket they buy over-the-top expensive food it's all very elaborate and they are very smug and pleased with themselves that they are going to have this well-earned break away from civilization because the characters are so over the top and smug and pleased with themselves the writing reflects that. I didn't realise that at first. At first I was slightly frustrated with the book because it felt very overwritten. It felt like the author was trying to show off. You know, sometimes you read a book and an author's using really long words when they really don't need to and it doesn't particularly add anything to the text and you can just see them behind their computer screen typing away thinking, I am going to show off here and I hate that like I really really hate it so at the beginning when I was reading it I was thinking oh no I, I am not sure about this book but then the more I got into it and of course I don't know this because author intent we can never know that but it did start to feel as though he was doing that deliberately so he is overwriting because these characters would do that that's how they would describe their own lives because they want to feel important and they want to use those big words and after that it started to become easier to get to grips with because it felt more like he was poking fun at them instead of trying to frustrate the reader so let me give you an example of that just in case you do pick it up and you're thinking i cannot with this writing everything okay back at the office clay could never resist pronouncing the office with a twist of something it was synecdoche for her profession, which he largely but not entirely understood. A spouse should have her own life, and Amanda's was quite apart from his. Maybe that helped explain their happiness. At least half of the couples they knew were divorced. It's fine. One of her most reachful truisms was that some percentage of jobs were indistinguishable from one another, as they all involved the sending of emails assessing the job itself. A workday with several communiques about the workday, then underway some bureaucratic politesse. 70 minutes at lunch, 20 minutes caroming around the open plan, 25 minutes drinking coffee. Sometimes her part in the charade felt silly, and other times it felt urgent. So Clay and Amanda have driven off into the countryside. They are telling themselves that they deserve this break because they earn lots of money. This is their reward. They've bought their overpriced food and their specialised gin and they're pretending that they own this house that they've only rented for the week because, as I said, this is their 
reward. And then halfway through their holiday, in the middle of the night, a couple called Ruth and GH appear on their doorstep and say, hi, we own this house. We need to come in because something has happened in the world. We don't know what it is, but we were driving home to New York and then we saw that the power had gone out across the city and we couldn't go home to our flat because it's really high up in a building, the lift wouldn't work. And plus, we think a terrible, awful thing has happened, not just a power outage, we think something terrible has happened, like a terror attack or a nuclear bomb or our country is now at war with someone. We just can't find out what's happened because the um, cell signal is out, the internet is down and the TV is not working. So will you please let us into our holiday home, which we've come to because we assumed that the electricity there still may be working. And can we hide out here until we can figure out what in the world is going on? So of course, Clay and Amanda are surprised because this wasn't supposed to happen on their holiday. Also, they don't believe GH and Ruth to begin with because they have nothing to back it up because as they said, the cell signal is down and the TV isn't working, the internet's not working. And they think maybe these people have cut the wires or something and that the service is only out in their house and that something terrible is gonna happen. Also, Amanda and Clay don't believe Ruth and GH because Ruth and GH are black and they think, well, how can this black couple own this beautiful house? I mean, we're white and we have lots of money and we don't own this house. Why should they own this house? Amanda and Clay don't think that they're racist people. They think they're really good people. They're clearly racist people. It is the most unsettling book I have read in so long and I could not stop reading it. So I read it pretty much in one sitting. Uh, Carmen Maria Machado said, I have never been this profoundly unnerved since I read Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go. And I wholeheartedly agree because it's just, it's not horror and it's not a dystopian novel. It's not a post-apocalyptic novel. It is this odd, timeless novel where you just do not know what is going on and you're focusing on the minute details, the, the tiny things that people do when they're put in stressful situations, as well as the huge things that they do, but their immediate gut responses and how awful that is and how it's highlighting bits of their character that maybe they weren't even aware of, not to say that other people around them weren't aware of it, but that they weren't aware of. They're taking themselves by surprise. It feels so primal. And as I said, it's so tense. So it's like a mystery, but also, oh no, I don't want to say more about it because I don't want to ruin it. It's brilliant and I would really, really recommend it. And as I said, the language at the beginning feels very over the top. I really feel that's there for a reason, so stick with it. I'm just gonna zoom past a couple of books here. I read Reckless Paper Birds by John McCullough and I read And Then She Ate Him by Tom Demby. These are both poetry collections which I spoke about in the Poetry Shelf book tour which I filmed a few weeks ago and I did some close readings of some of the poems in there. So if you want to find out more, I will link that video in the description box down below. I also finished reading Cunning Folk which is a brilliant magazine. This is their first issue. This is a magazine about the esoteric, it's about witch craft, um, herbal remedies, it is about um, elements and getting to grips with nature but it also has ghost stories in here as well and poetry with beautiful illustrations. I will link their website in the description box down below, I think that they're great. I then read, I say read, examined, admired, looked at Beasts of India which is published by Tara Books. This is one of their handbound books where they are highlighting art from different parts of India and they're showing how um, different artists draw the same animals. So this is one version of a tiger, then we have another version of a tiger and then uh, a third version too. So there are lots of different creatures in here. Um, this one is one of my favorites. I think I just love the color scheme. This is a deer. So I really love Tara books. I've mentioned them a few times recently in gift guides, etc. but I think that they're amazing. They have a great video on their website where they show how all of their hand book, hand bound books are made and that's well worth your time. So I'll link that in the description box down below. I've pulled a chair over because I was getting a lot of pins and needles sitting on the floor. Plus, I've tried to talk about this book for about half an hour. The light has now gone because I've been talking about it so much and I've just been getting a bit frustrated. So I am gonna try and sum up my thoughts more concisely because the thought of trying to edit that half hour of me 
wrangling with my thoughts is, is gonna be a challenge. Okay, so l let's try this again. I read this, which is You're Not Listening by Kate Murphy. This is a proof copy, it came out last year, and the blurb says, at work, we're taught to lead the conversation. On social media, we shape our personal narratives. At parties, we talk over one another, so do our politicians. We're not listening, and no one is listening to us. So for context, I've had this on my shelf um, for about a year now, and I've been meaning to get to it, but then something happened a few weeks ago where I thought, I really would like to read this now. So I made a video, um, I can't even remember what the video is called, but it was a couple of weeks ago, talking about the latest adaptation of The Witches, the new film. I wasn't speaking about the film itself, but I was speaking about what had happened after the release of that film, where they had changed the depiction of the witches slightly so that they also had extradactyly, which is the condition that I have with missing fingers. The witches also have um, missing hair. I have alopecia too, and they have um, missing toes. The hair and the toes aspects, they're, they're in the book to begin with, but not the missing fingers. So this falls into a literary trope, which is the disfigurement equals villainy trope. It is a recognized problem in the film industry, um, so much so that the BFI no longer fund films where directors choose to show a villain who has a disfigurement as a marker for their evil. So it wasn't just about this one film, it feeds into a much wider picture and something that I've been talking about anyway for ages. So I had spoken about the latest version of The Witches, that post had gone viral, I was then on the radio, TV, various different news outlets, along with other people who have limb differences and we were talking about this and why it's not great and why we need to have this conversation and why things need to change. Not just with regard to the witches film, but as I said, in general in the film industry and why this is not just a film. Like the, the repercussions of media that we constantly consume with messages like that. How does it impact people who have visual differences? For instance, the marketing campaign for the witches actively encouraged children to go out and notice witches in real life. They said to look out for these things, missing fingers, missing hair, etc. It was ridiculous. Anyway, because as this book says, and as I'm sure we have all noticed, on social media in particular, two sides of an argument can often just shout at each other and there's not much room for nuance and it's an echo chamber and it's a case of people dumping stuff and then running away from a conversation. Um, and I'm gonna get into that more in a second. I didn't really want that to be the case with my post about the witches because my post had gone viral. It had been taken out of context and it was shown on Sky News and because of that, loads of people came over to me um, and some of them were supportive but a lot of them were you know you're ridiculous of course people are scared of people like you you're ugly uh, blah 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 disabled people are terrifying they should be the villains in films that trope is there for a reason um, and a lot of people saying it's just a film you know get over it all, all of that stuff but I didn't want that to be just a shouting match online I made such an effort to try and talk with as many people as possible. And sometimes that worked a little bit, mostly it didn't for the reasons that I have just mentioned. Like the internet is not designed to be a place where we have in-depth conversations on the whole, but that is not always the case. I think you might be able to hear the parrots outside. So that is why I wanted to read this book now, I really hoped this book would kind of take some of those topics, not the personal ones that I've just been talking about, but the that idea of we're not talking and communicating with each other properly. Like, how do we approach that? How do we, how do we fix that? Not just talking about online stuff, but just in life. I was very much up for a deep dive into conversation theory. But this is an instance of a nonfiction book which tries to cover too much ground and therefore hops from one subject to another. That could still be fascinating, but a lot of these topics are quite sensitive and if you don't handle them properly, at best it's baffling and at worst it's really insensitive. And I felt that in, in places in this book it was quite insensitive. It's also a non-fiction book that very clearly takes the stance. The internet is not good. It doesn't encourage conversation. These companies, they want to make us addicted to their platforms, so they make sure that we can only absorb short 
amounts of information and then they bounce us around from different topics so that we don't really could you hear that i swear every every day at sunset all the parrots are here <laughs> um what was i saying it's not the internet that's distracting me it's the parrots okay um wow <laughs> that companies such as twitter they want us to absorb or at least look at tiny fragments of information and then we mine for more information on different topics and we kind of just lose ourselves and it means that everything is in bits instead of spending a lot of time on one particular thing. I agree with that. I agree that the people who make these sites are designing it in a specific way to make us behave like that. I believe that because it's addictive, we buy into it as users. But what I would like to know is why we were so much better at conversing beforehand i would like to know data on that was it so much better before or is this just highlighting problems that exist already in our society and and what's the relationship between those two things so she never goes into detail on that at all or even brush up against it she never examines also parts of the internet where long form conversation is there and where people can establish real connections with each other I realize I'm coming at this from someone who spends so much time online and I have done that from a very young age. I was very into forums when I was younger. So this is before social media, when I was a teenager, I made true friendships with people on those forums that existed not just online, but also in some cases offline. Some of those people I am still friends with. Now, of course, I have a YouTube channel. And I mean, I know there's a lot of jokes in there in that I'm talking to myself right now and I'm filming it and then I'm throwing it out online. But we do have conversations, as I'm sure you're aware, if you have been here a long time, we have conversations in the comments. And this community exists offline too in real life events when I go on book tour or when I do events in bookshops about reading. So. It's not just a case always on the internet of people shouting at each other. There is room for genuine connection. So she makes a point at some, uh, which I half agree with, that we can idealize people online and we don't view them as complex people. And therefore real life people become more um, frustrating because we see all of their complexities. That's true to an extent online, but it's not making room for the true connections that you have with people and the true friendships that can come out of that where you do listen to each other and you talk on the phone and via email and you're definitely communicating. There is a lot of love to be found online. So I, I really didn't appreciate that kind of blanket internet bad. No, conversation terrible. We can only have conversations in real life. It also happens to be frustrating for a different reason too, in that it comes across, and I'm gonna contextualize this statement, don't worry, it comes across quite ableist. Like you can only have true interactions with people when you meet up physically with someone. And I mean, I'm not gonna fault this book for the fact that it was published in 2019 and it's not taking into account anything that's happening in 2020. It cannot see into the future, but this year, has highlighted how we have had to communicate with people from afar. And yes, sometimes there is definitely a lack there and, and we can come away, for instance, from Zoom meetings that are business meetings, feeling so emotionally drained because it is difficult sometimes to communicate via video. Your, your brain has to think in a different way. You can miss certain um, social cues. It's definitely not without its challenges, but it's also not terrible and i and i use the um phrase that that came across as quite ableist because a lot of this book felt like that a lot of this book felt like it was speaking to able-bodied straight white people let me explain what i mean there are lots of instances in this book where she uses the word deaf as a synonym for inattentive that if we're not listening to someone we are deaf to them we are speaking a language of the deaf i know that that's an idiom but it's an old one and we shouldn't really be using it anymore so there's a lot of dismissive language surrounding deafness. And as I said, she kind of cherry picks the topic she's gonna to talk about and doesn't go into detail about them at all. So I was hoping when she started talking about deafness that she was going to talk about communication with regard to deafness um, and explore that because this is a book about listening in, in all its different forms. But the only thing she said was, 
Deaf, uh, research on deaf and hearing impaired children has shown they have a diminished ability to empathise and affiliate. There is also extensive research on the detrimental emotional, cognitive and behavioural effects on those who have lost their hearing in later life. Helen Keller said, I am just as deaf as I am blind. Deafness is a much worse misfortune for it means a loss of the most vital stimulus, the sound of the voice that brings language, sets thoughts astir and keeps us in the intellectual company of men. And then she moves on to a different topic. This is a quote that's been taken from someone who is deaf, um, but I also think it's been kind of shoehorned in there and taken slightly out of context. She's saying that deaf children can't assimilate, they don't understand emotions and can't communicate as well, but that's putting the onus on them. I feel like the the conversation surrounding this should be how society is so dismissive of disabled and deaf people and does not make space for them. If a deaf child is struggling to understand facial expressions and emotion, is that not because society is, I was gonna say ill-equipped, but is refusing to equip and adapt to talk to people who are deaf? That is something that is missing in this book. Um, when she's talking about um, neurodivergent people, etc. People who differ from her version of the norm. And at no point in this book does she address that power imbalance. So she discusses how sometimes speakers invited to universities, etc., are told not to come because they are there to talk on a subject that some students may find offensive and how bad that is because we should always talk to people and engage with people who have different opinions to us. Again, I am not the opposite of that. As I was saying before, I think we do need to have conversation and we do need to interact with people who have different views to us because that is life and it's important to remember that that is what life is like. But there is such a vast difference between me or anybody else sitting down and having a conversation with someone who has a differing view and me paying someone to come and talk about that specific subject that may have a directly harmful impact on say minority groups where they, they have that influence and that power. It's, it's so different. And I would love her to have talked about those different things but she doesn't. She just says cancelling people is wrong. And like, I'm not talking about cancel culture, she's saying cancelling events, etc., and not listening to people. I am not for cancel culture either. I, I am, as I said, looking for the nuance within these conversations and not really finding them and, and feeling let down. She also says in this book, the only way to encourage people to listen to you is to continually listen to them, actively listen to them. And again, there is no discussion on the imbalance there. She says, if someone has a different view to you and you're confident in your view, someone who's confident in their view never minds having their view challenged because they relish the opportunity to reiterate why they believe in that thing. That may be true if we're talking about something that's very emotionally detached, something that's very academic, but what if we're not talking about those things? What if we're talking about white supremacy? What if we're talking about um, homophobia? What if we're talking about any of those things and we're asking a gay person to sit down and have a conversation with someone who thinks that they're a terrible person? How are we supposed to encourage that kind of listening? If you are a queer person, a person of colour, a disabled person, a person with disfigurements, on the whole, and I know this is quite a general thing to say, but fr from my personal experience and others who I know, you're probably gonna be someone who's very good at listening um, and you're very good at picking up on social cues um, and people's expressions, navigating difficult territory whereby people have constantly told you what they think of you and, and who you should be, how you should behave. And you've had to make room for that your whole life. <laughs> To then be told you need to have an equal playing field with people who despise you and your role is someone who should just constantly listen and make space when the other person is not doing that, 
I fundamentally disagree with that. And I wish that she had talked about that, given some space to the discussion of the imbalance of power within those conversations and when it's appropriate to stop. There is a chapter right at the end of the book, which is called When to Stop Listening. And I thought, here it is, we're gonna get the answers now, but not really. She talks about people on an individual basis. If you're engaging, talking to a jerk who's not listening to you, continues not to listen. It's your prerogative to work out when to walk away from that conversation. And and yes, that's true. But what about society as a whole? What about these ongoing conversations where society has dismissed a lot of people's voices? Um, How do you walk away or disengage from that? You you can't, Um, or at least you can, as she said, on an individual basis, but it's something you know you're gonna have to go back to and back to. I'm not saying I would never have difficult conversations with people. I have difficult conversations with people all the time. I think what I mean is that she's saying it's a choice to get into those conversations. And really often it's not. And she, as I said, leaves no room to to explore that. Anyway, I'm gonna stop talking about that book because I've spoken about it so much. It's just, I've been thinking about it all the time, (laughs) all the time. Because I am someone who is really fascinated about listening and conversations. I think writers, and this is a point that she makes in the book, writers generally are good listeners. We pay attention to people, we are observers, because we examine the human condition. Like We want to take it apart, we want to understand how it works. I would talk to you all day about the logistics of linguistics. I know that I'm talking to myself here, I know I'm talking to you, but in the moment I'm speaking to a camera, it's a one-sided conversation, but in other areas of my my job, I go into schools, I have to communicate with children, establish relationships with them really quickly through conversation. I record podcasts and that's something she also speaks about in this book. So I am in a hopefully non-manipulative way trying to think of ways to get people to talk and go deeper in conversations to create a really great podcast episode. So I'm fascinated by these things. I just was not fascinated by the way this book handled them and I felt quite let down. Okay, because it's basically night time now, let us quickly go through the other books I read. I read this, which is absolutely delightful. If you need a stocking filler, a small gift for someone this Christmas, I so recommend this. It's by Catherine Rundell. It's called Why You Should Read Children's Books Even Though You're Old and Wise. So it's talking about how great children's stories are and how we can learn things from them no matter what age we are. Honestly, made me want to cry a bit. It was so lovely. I'm so frustrated. I just realized I could have changed the lighting settings on this camera. All right, let's try that again. Uh, This is the Dragon Tea Society. Isn't that better? Guys. (laughs) It's been a long day. This is The Tea Dragon Society by Katie O'Neill. This is a graphic novel and it is one of the most adorable things that I've ever read. If you just need a feel good book in your life, then this is it. It's about a young girl who finds this dragon here, Jasmine, who has been not abandoned, she has lost her way. So she takes her back to her owner, who is this guy here and the owner explains that he looks after dragons and they all grow different kinds of tea out of their heads and so he cares for them and then they can brew the tea and the tea has different magical powers so she decides that she is going to become part of the tea dragon society and it has great queer rep and disability rep and as i said it's just like a warm hug. It is so delightful and frankly just what I needed. And speaking of just what I needed, I then read this, which is another graphic novel of hers called Princess Princess Ever After by Katie O'Neill. The art style is slightly different in here, but this is about Princess Sadie and Princess Amira. Amira rescues Sadie, or rather her unicorn Celeste does, and then they ride off together and then they rescue this other prince here. Again, feel good, warm fuzzies, delightful. Love it. I read a couple of picture books. This is by Momoko Abe. This is Avocado Asks. It's an avocado who is having an identity crisis in the supermarket because he doesn't know if he's a fruit or a vegetable. And he's going around the supermarket trying to figure out what he is. And the tomato in particular has no sympathy for the avocado at all. It's really lovely. I did um, or was part of a campaign with Book Trust where children's authors were paired up 
with authors and illustrators of colour who were just emerging into the industry and um, those authors and illustrators took over our Instagram accounts for the day. So Momoko had um, photos that were posted over on my Instagram showing her fantastic work. So if you hadn't seen that, I'll link it in the description box down below. I adore her style and I can't wait for her new picture book, which is coming out in March. I also read The Bandit Queen by the O'Hara sisters. This is about the queen of a group of bandits. And it made me laugh because we just finished watching The Queen's Gambit and this sounds similar. I wonder if this has boost the sales at all by sounding slightly similar. The end papers are amazing. Um, I thought the illustrations were absolutely fantastic. I did enjoy the way that it's written. It's very tongue twistery. You're supposed to fall over your words, but the rhythm of it slightly threw me off and in a way that didn't feel quite deliberate, but this is how it begins. The woods are full of horrible sounds to make you quiver and quake. The wail of a wolf, a lonely owl's yowl, the hiss of a slithery snake. But worse than the wail or the yowl or the hiss, the horridest sound in the woods sounds like this. I love the illustration so much and it is a lot of fun. And then finally, I read this silent graphic novel which is called The Wanderer. It feels heavily inspired by Sean Tan's The Arrival. It's about a paper boat this little paper boat here and all of the amazing adventures that it goes on. It's in black and white, it travels the seas, it encounters all of these strange creatures. It is the most stunning book. I love it. I think I may gift it quite a bit at Christmas. So those are all the books that I wanted to speak about today. Good luck in the future to me editing this. I would love to know your thoughts in the comments section down below. If you have read any of these books, let me know what you've been reading recently. I hope you're all having a great start to the week and I'll speak to you soon. Lots of love. Bye.